This is the vertical column of my Mitsui surface grinder. It has hardened D2 rails that the cast iron head rides on with a, just an oil film scraped surface. And I'm going to change that to a needle bearing situation. As you can see here, this uh, has oil galleys to feed the uh, system and this is in pretty bad shape. But this is gonna be reasonably easy, chuckle, chuckle, uh, to convert this to a needle roller bearing situation where we're gonna be able to preload this and have a much greater stiffness and fine increment down feed. Here's a view of the completed cages. I'm going to show next how where I got the rollers from, the individual rollers, and then also the design details and aspects that I considered in making these cages. What does one do when you need six or seven hundred needles for a linear needle bearing conversion to your surface grinder vertical feed? You buy some appropriate needle, cage needle bearings and rip the cage out and salvage the bearings. Uh, the reason that we're using caged versus non-caged is the non-caged have little tits on the ends that are meant to be caught by the lips of the uh, drawn cup and they're not very conducive to a standard uh, machine cage that I'm going to be making for the linear linear cages. So that's why I'm doing these. You'd actually get more needles per bearing by using the uh, full complement needle bearing as opposed to the caged but uh, like I said you'd end up with the pointy ended uh, rollers which um, won't won't work as nicely in a cage. They would work but they just wouldn't work as nicely. Buying rollers individually is not as easy as you would think uh, even though you would think hey what should be like dime a dozen since they don't even have to put them in the in the uh, cage or or in the in the bearing, but um, turns out it's uh, easier said than done unless you're buying you know monumental quantities. So uh, back to just buying a bunch of uh, bearings and tearing the uh, cages out. Here I've modeled the uh, column and head of the Mitsui very accurately and uh, this way I can actually work in SolidWorks and determine what I'm going to do here and now I'm looking down the the vertical column and these represent these blocks right here represent the hardened D2 rails and what I've done here is these pockets you see are where I'm going to put hardened steel inserts in they're going to be glued in place and I thought about how I was going to do those by A2 get it heat treated all that and I realized, duh, buy some uh, high-speed steel planer blades from uh, Grizzly Tool. Relatively inexpensive, reasonably high, you know, high quality uh, steel. And that way I can just uh, glue those in and grind them. So that provides the hardened surface on this side for the roller. And the D2 rail right here represents the other um, hardened insert. Whenever you have rolling element bearings, you have to have above at least like 58 Rockwell to have something that's going to, to work well. So that enables us to do this. This right here, insert here, gives us the lateral control. And then these two will be preloaded on against each other. And this gap you see right here is will have a fitted spacer that will control exactly the preload of the um, races against the rollers. So this gets sandwiched. and. Um, small needles are chosen because number one everything I do here takes up space that thins this the material in the head so I don't want to weaken this any more than necessary you also get more damping by having multiple small rollers and you also get more elastic averaging uh, of minimizing the roundness effects of the rollers because you have so many of them engaged in one time they tend to average out the rumble of the out of roundness of the rollers. When we're, talk, we're talking micro inches down here, that, that levels that we're, we're speaking about. So another aspect of this is that the um, cage in this case, I'm making a decision to make this cage just about exactly 2,000 smaller than the roller. 
I have to leave some room because the roller actually gets compressed when it's preloaded. But what I'm shooting for here is these cages being phenolic would act as an actual bearing surface in themselves. But I also want to get some squeeze film damping. You got a very thin gap, you've got a viscous oil or material in the gap, and when that gap tries to fluctuate, the flow of oil required in the resistance that flow causes a damping effect. So all these things are such uh, things that contribute to this being s stiffer, but having a less stick slip as far as making very, very small incremental downfeed moves, uh, and yet be st stiffer probably than the oil film version because you need some oil film clearance so there is some oil squirm effects so all these are reasons why I said wow this thing's just screaming to have needle bearing rollers there's other reasons why I'm doing this and that is because I'm planning on all kinds of crazy things being mounted to the head on a, uh, a kind of like a pallet system that uses a kinematic keystone kinematic mount top and bottom that will allow things like jig grinder spindles and all these things like that so the the stability of this head laterally is much more important than it would be for just grinding where in in theory surface grinding wise it wouldn't matter if this thing moves side to side um, as long as the the uh, orientation of the spindle was maintained so all of those are reasons why we did that now the design of the cage itself um, I'm showing the assembly here. One of the things is when I talked about the oil, the um, cage being able to be just a few thousand smaller than the roller. Well, the cage then, these two cage pieces, this upper and lower, need to be able to float to accommodate that. I, there's no way I could machine this and have this all work out to where that, um, you know, worked out perfectly. So by putting a dovetail feature on this cage, where these latch into each other, it lets this, these two side cages, the front and back cage, actually move to whatever accommodates the position, yet holds them positionally, both axially and laterally, relative to the other cage, so that they, they track properly. One of the f aspects of a cage is that, uh, especially with rollers, one, when you have them preloaded, they're going to want to track uh, in a particular orientation. Wherever they're aimed, they're going to want to stay that way. So there can be great forces. If these slots weren't exactly perpendicular to the travel, you could have things where the rollers would actually break the cage from trying to run off and track in the direction they want to go. So squareness of the roller axes um, is very critical to this working and not uh, breaking itself up. Here's the cage assembly by itself and you can see how these latch into each other and one of the details here is you notice how I made this to be machinable with a 16th end mill so that in the same setting where I'm milling these grooves I'm able to come in here and do this shape and the other edge detail the male piece here well male on this side um, is uh, also be able to be done with an end mill. So I'm, I'm thinking machinability and process as I'm designing this. So you could design this with a thing here and say, oh, I've got to come in here with a little dovetail cutter, got to grind a little dovetail cutter to, to make this. But these reliefs here have no effect on the functionality of this cage. All this is doing is holding the cage in position, axially, laterally, but allowing it to float um, in the other axis. So these notches here, uh, to be able to do this with an end mill, are irrelevant. Now we're looking at the actual needle pocket structure. And you'll notice that I have these staggered back and forth. And the reason for that is I have a particular roller length which was chosen based on the most economical needle roller that gave me the most needles for the money, but had a, a width close to what I was after. Um, but because of the width of the of the hardened insert that I had, I wanted to use more area of it, uh, and so I staggered these back and forth. Wouldn't actually be necessary, but basic in theory, this spreads the fatigue load out over more of the width of the full insert, um, so it can be helpful. Here, the pocket you can see I've got a relief here, and what that does is when the roller sits in here this keeps the roller from being able to fall out where it's not covered um, by the ways so this cage actually hangs out in the air on either end 
a linear cage moves half the distance that the one of the sliding elements does. So there's the, there's an exact length of cage that will stay engaged for a full length of travel. Um, so that means these are going to be hanging out in space, but this will make sure that the roller is held captive and can't fall out just because it's exposed. And then these sides right here uh, at each end are what give it the precise guidance, but we don't want it to be have more rubbing area than necessary to keep it square because believe it or not the torque required to roll move these rollers to rotate them you don't want it so snug that um, the rollers are hard to turn because it will end up actually causing quite a bit of drag force in having to spin all those rollers when they're when they're preloaded they won't they won't skate I originally had these dovetails up here at the top sharp edged and I was going to grind a cutter and then in thinking about trying to make these so they could be completely machined in one operation on my clamping system with the same end mill, 1 16th end mill, I realized oh, I'll just put these pockets in and so that's why I mentioned before that, that I did. Lubrication wise, these channels from one end here to the other end here to the other end here basically forms a situation where the oil has to flow through all of them to get through. You can't have an oil pocket or an air pocket where um, oil can just seep out and not get get to where it's going. It has to travel the full length of the cage. And remember, these faces of the um, each side of this are up against the hardened way surface with only about a thousandth of an inch gap. So these this is pretty much a kind of a controlled cavity that will allow this oil to flow and stay in there. I'm going to be using Vector number four, which is relatively thick. Uh, whey oil and clings very well so this will get pre-filled with that and then the oil galley system that you saw in the beginning there with the oil cups will just maintain a supply that is feeds into the um, into this pocket area and as these roll by they'll, they'll just get filled as they they go past but um, shouldn't be a whole lot of flow because of the very very small gap that we have here so here we show the head and the column and the cage. The cage is not moving like it would in reality. If I move this an inch, the cage would move half an inch. Two inches, this would move one inch. So there, it's it's in mesh, if you if you will, um, based on that. And here's where I'm showing how those little lips that are on this side keep the rollers captive. They can't fall out in this direction because everywhere they're actually held against that central rail, and the rail is inside the cage for the full extent of travel no matter how far we go so that's that's how that works and obviously I'm only showing the cage on one side for for technical purposes but it's on the other side also and the lateral the, these inner um, cages the inner um, width cage is adjusted by moving one of these rails there's actually screws to move the rails to preload that gently on each side to preload it laterally also so that's the general design ideas that were involved in designing the cage. The spacing of the rollers was something relatively arbitrary, having a decent number of rollers but not so close that the cage strength would be compromised and not so far apart that the number of rollers bearing the load would be too small. It's probably overkill in my case here, but I'm after real high stiffness with a relatively light uh, preload. The aspects of doing the modifications to the castings and uh, going the inserts in will be covered in another video. This is strictly uh, relative to the cage design and making the cages in this video. I'm sawing the linen phenolic material here with a Harbor Freight tile saw with a regular tile saw blade. You can see that this cuts pretty nicely and leaves a decent finish. And um, we're cutting the strips roughly before we surface grind them. Here I've got an aluminum vacuum fixture with three steel feet glued on the back so that I could be able to hold them on the chuck when I flip it over using the spring hold downs to do that at the moment. Drilling the vacuum entry hole on the end of the fixture. I have the aluminum block in, it's been surface ground with the silver carbide wheel and stone and I have my 70 durometer o-ring cut the length and, and glue on the end with uh, super glue. So we just take our piece and clean it off well, 
line up visually over the area and my son's going to turn the vacuum pump on and that quick goes right up to full vacuum you see the uh, gauge there and the glare it's, it's uh, trust me it's all up as, as much as that vacuum pump will do and uh, it's it's on there solid it's, it's definitely uh, down, down fast so silicon carbide wheel is a good wheel for grinding plastic uh, crispy plastic like this phenolic and uh, hopefully I'll be able to park off that uh, whatever it is uh, 45,000 so you have to take off I guess in general um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, this has some fabric texture on this side which I don't want so I'm going to just skin this side to clean up to get a nice brown finish on this side then I will flip it and take the rest off to get down to the 074 stick that we're shooting for here I'm putting the o-ring back in putting a piece down again and I'm just taking a plunge cut on this full wheel width as I go across these and you'll notice all the color in the coolant there that's all of the phenolic material that's coming off and here I'm just getting the fur off of the or the fabric texture off of the um, phenolic the as molded uh, fabric texture kind of shows through that glossy surface and I want to get rid of that that glossy surface is also not the best for lubrication wise <clears throat> you can see there where it's ground down flipped over now and now we're going to take substantial cuts where I'm removing the um, I'm actually creep feeding at almost full depth just leaving enough for a single finish pass uh, once I get the most material removed because this cuts very easily with a silicon carbide wheel and here I'm doing my my pass where I'm just taking a traverse pass across there for the finish cut on that now when you see me peel this off you'll see how deep that cut was going from an eighth inch down to like 074 and almost one cut flipping it around end for end to do the other side you can see all the concentration of that phenolic dust in the coolant there it'll clog a filter in a heartbeat so beware if you grind this stuff but it grinds very nicely <clears throat> finish pass again smooth now I'm doing the edges I've got it clamped to a, a long bar so that I can maintain the squareness all four pieces are uh, or six pieces are actually clamped together and now I just slide my whole block down on the chuck to maintain my position and height and everything and just re-grab the bar and I'm able to do that one long length which is longer than the grinder uh, more than accurate enough for for what we're doing here so I'm creep feeding the majority of the material off and then coming down and doing a you know finish pass on on these Now that that one side's done, uh, I flipped them over and did the other. And here I'm squaring the ends. I have it in the vise crossways, and I'm actually just creep feeding through full depth of cut. All one cut right through. Measuring the overall length there. Now I've got a sanding block there with some diamond film on it, and I'm just using that to deburr, get any uh, burrs off of there, and, and get it ready for the rest of the milling operations. You can see the linen phenolic in there. Cleaning off my um, uh, fixture plate that I use with my clamps that you've seen in my previous ball uh, uh, ball cage video. Cleaning out where this is going to sit in the bottom of the vise. Flipping this over, letting that sit down tight. I have my jack screws backed off a little bit so they're not touching the top of the vices here. And I tighten each vise up independently as I'm pressing down and then once I've done that, I will tap down using the hardened A2 block that I use for tapping finished parts. Works very well. Then I'll come in and actually put an indicator on here, the at rest position. That's zeroed there. And then I adjust. That's a set screw on top working against the screw at the bottom. And I'm actually intentionally putting a thousandth preload on there. I'm bowing the thing up. Got a mirror finish on my fly cutter there. Diamond lapped. And that piece of uh, ABS is uh, double sticky taped down, and I'm using that as my uh, flattened surface. 
Now I'm doing the actual dovetail edge treatment with a uh, O flute, 16th O flute cutter. And here we're doing the pocket mill along with the oil grooves that you saw. And this is the same procedure where we have these clamps that can be moved at will. I pause the program, just slide these along. Doing the next pocket, just moving our way down through. And that's just a actual subroutine that's moved down incrementally on the whole part. Move the clamps again, carry on down through. And uh, this works very effectively for this style of part. You can also see why I was trying to design with a single cutter, uh, since I don't have a tool changer, a single cutter and able to do the entire part contour um, in one shot with one cutter. So that uh, makes life a lot easier and keeps everything regist registered to itself well. Just using dry air here to uh, blow the chips away and I have my vacuum system that's always on the mill there that's sucking away all the dust. Do a lot of cast iron work so <clears throat> That's a must-have for uh, getting rid of the dust there. So it turns out that the position difference of the roller notches between this one with this style edge and this one that has the other mating part of the dovetail is a sixteenth of an inch uh, from 9.30 seconds to 7.30 seconds. So I'm just going to use rollers to space this off from the same setup uh, so I don't even have to move the program. I'm putting my 8th inch diameter pins in. This happened to be burrs in this case, carbide burrs. And then I am taking the strip in place. But I'm putting my 1 16th dowels between here and the pin to give me my spacing and this phases this other part in with the exact same program uh, lines it up so I can just run don't have to have a different program or you know shift the whole program by a certain amount I can just do it directly so I've got that in the pocket there, put my clamp on, press firmly, and I just work my way down the down the line here, pressing these tight against the pins. I'm tight against my end stop pin here, and uh, put my clamps on, and run the program just like I did with the other ones. And the edge dovetail on these will get machined in a different setup. Here I'm using a uh, diamond sanding disc, which is basically nickel plated diamond. The diamond is uh, plated onto those little spots with nickel, so there's no free abrasives loose. I'm using that for deburring, getting rid of the fuzz on the edges of the um, all the cuts. I have two pieces of tool steel together that I'm milling the edges on just to square them up to use as jaw liners for doing thin work like this. Here I'm surface grinding them individually. I'm doing it half at a time diagonally on the on the chuck so that I can actually grind the whole length of these. And then uh, you'll see there where I've spun it, done the other side and blended in just seeing how it matched up. Now I'm using that to do the edge dovetail treatment on the one uh, uh, cage that supports the other two cages. And you can see I'm just going around using an end mill to circle around and do the actual dovetails on there obviously sped up flipping it doing the other side so you think bozo doesn't visit these parts huh well very first move of the very first part just after getting done grinding these parallels nice and parallel um, I noticed this going deeper than I'd like and I'm supposed to be programming 90 thousandths deep 0.09 and on the very first move I programmed 0.9, missed the zero. So uh, nice raspberry there on my parallels. So I'll have to make sure I use them inverted all the time <laughs> so I don't see that. So I have the two uh, bars that I ground to be basically 
linear jaw facings for full length work. This, I just super glued a piece of uh, a 10,000 spray steel on here. And this is just held by the friction of the, of the jaw on the back because I'm using the wavy parallels here to preload my other parallel in the center. And I'll show you that when I expose. So I'm just peeling that off. That was just to control the, um, the end position so that once I uh, edge, edge found this, um, the, the position would be good. And I was just trusting, it was not critical, the, the, the actual axial position of this is not critical. So I wasn't really worried about it, about it moving. And now we're going to back up the jaws here and show you what was going on inside. I have to back up all three. I'm just looking at one right now. Uh, so this jaw was sitting on parallel or on the dowel pin to bring it up to the top. It's only an inch and a half high, roughly. And um, so that's what they were sitting there under there for. Then I had the actual parallel that I was using in the back here. And then I was using the wavy parallels to preload all this together. So this was actually pretty stiff because this was squeezed down almost completely flat. And the other jaw is sitting on the dowel pins also. So that was the that was the setup on how I did that. I had these all three vice locations I had those set so that when I pushed down I wasn't pushing down the part over air as there was a parallel under it everywhere. And then I just grabbed it nice and solid. And like I said, the friction of this wavy parallel compressing this very tightly just frictionally held this that parallel in place so that my uh, X location stayed good for running all these. On the right has been deburred, on the left is before being deburred. You can see all the fuzzy edges from the linen material in this phenolic and that all has to be removed. So I'm using diamond plated uh, mandrels and things to abrade this and the advantage there is that there's no free abrasives to get stuck into the uh, phenolic. You don't want to charge this thing with material that could end up chewing up your rollers over time. And um, so that, that's a bad thing. So using various shapes, uh, you'll see here in the next shot, I'm doing the uh, back sides of these, just relatively low speed, just letting the thing ride actually in the groove to chamfer the edges. Using the um, sanding or the diamond sanding block again to knock off the, the burrs and um, get those things nice and flat. Those sanding things work real great. As you can see there, it's 800. This is 800 mesh, which is a really nice size. It's, it removes material reasonably well, but doesn't leave a coarse finish. Now I'm using a little teen cone to get in here and to get these these transitions where there's there's that fuzz from the breakout there on the edges, um, and going in and manually doing all these. Yeah, I have to do this to every single spot on all the sides, um, but yeah, just necessary. And um, using the flexible shaft, which is nice and controllable uh, and quiet compared to an air tool doing the same thing just riding around the part to deburr the edges of the uh, dovetail milled section the uh, that nice little small diameter um, cutter and the small diameter of the body work well here I'm just using it manually to go in and just drag and uh, basically sand the edges of the little lip that's in there that uh, captivates the roller from being able to slip through. This is a, a very very fine uh, abrasive nylon brush and this is basically just removing the hair off of uh, anything that's left getting rid of that and in theory there could be some free abrasives but this is super super fine and um, it, it really does a nice job of just uh, getting that last little bit of fuzz off of there so that these have a, a decent finish. You have to hit it from a lot of different angles uh, you know, over and over, but works works really well to um, clean these up because uh, the the hairy nature of phenolic is is um, people who've who've worked with it know exactly what I'm talking about. It's uh, it's one of those difficult aspects of it is getting a, a nice smooth finish when you got a lot of operations because the fibers of the of the fabric that it was made from, you know, don't cut as easily as the crispy uh, resin that it's been molded in. 
I've washed these with a uh, strong degreaser, scrubbed them with a toothbrush. Basically the whole idea being to get rid of any loose uh, particles, abrasive particles, even though I used all bonded, nickel bonded abrasives on this. There shouldn't be any free abrasives. Uh, I did use a abrasive uh, nylon bristle brush to deburr some of the edges. Uh, so in theory there could be some minor contamination there. So that's the main reason for doing a really severe uh, thorough scrub of these and rinse to get rid of all that. So I have my um, PVC heat sealable uh, material here, tubular, and I'm putting these in to keep them clean until it's assembly time. And we're going to be putting these together and putting them on the, um, on the machine. So um, these are going to get all inserted into the bag. I'm just going to grab them all, get them in. Okay, move up here to my heat sealer that's hanging on the wall. And uh, I do take it down if I need to, but right now I'm just going to heat seal this and cut it. Hope you found that interesting or informative or both. And uh, like I said, I'll be covering the other aspects of the needle bearing conversion, meaning the hardened ways and lapping the D2 rails to make sure they're good and parallel and the preload system and a subsequent video on the rest of the Mitsui rebuild. There'll be quite a few items on that. So um, hopefully I'll get to them a little quicker than I have been.